Hello everybody, welcome to another brand new episode of Mega Projects. This one is all about the Three Gorges Dam, which many people requested. So if you're thinking, thank you Simon, for making my request, you're very welcome. I'm not going to thank anyone in particular because loads of people did, and let's crack on. I'm also powered by the Three Wolf Mug today, which is not a merch item, but it's available on Amazon. When we talk about mega projects, there is one colossus that really stands out, a project both vastly ambitious and hugely controversial. Almost 90 years from its inception to its opening in 2003, it is now the biggest hydroelectric dam in the world. A true beast which has shattered countless records for size, weight, and power generated. It's got enough concrete to build eight Hoover dams and the steel equivalent of 63 Eiffel Towers. Indeed, it's fair to say there's never been anything quite like the Three Gorges Dam. Stretching across the Yangtze River in China's Hubei district, the Three Gorges Dam has become a symbol of Chinese progress. This staggering project raised the bar of human achievements, but it came at an eye-watering cost, both in terms of monetary value, but also to those living nearby. This dam was always going to be a balancing act. From its early designs, it was clear that this was a project that could bring huge benefits to a country eager to cement its place as a world leader but it also had the potential to cause an enormous amount of human and ecological suffering. What we see in the video today is truly impressive. At 175 meters, that's 574 feet in height, 181 meters, that's 593 feet in width at its base, and 1.5 miles, 2.4 kilometers in length, it is by far the largest dam in the world. It's capable of producing 22,500 megawatts of electricity, and just later in the video, I'm gonna give you some idea of the scale of that compared to nuclear power plants and it's pretty insane. Its reservoir can hold an astonishing 9.43 cubic miles, that's 39.3 cubic kilometers of water, which would weigh around 43 billion tons. <laughs> These numbers just get, keep getting crazier and crazier. This is a man-made concentration of water so large that it's actually slowed the rotation of the Earth. NASA has estimated that because of the dam, Earth's day is now 0.06 microseconds longer, and a microsecond is a millionth of a second, by the way. So, you know, it's not slowed it much, but still, we did that as humans. I mean, the Chinese did that. I didn't do it, certainly, but, you know, we as a species. The Chinese we. While the Three Gorges Dam is a wonder of modern technology and engineering, the idea originated 75 years before construction began in 1994. Sun Yat-sen was a former president of the Republic of China, and he first floated the idea of a dam on the Yangtze River in 1919 in order to generate electricity, but also as an attempt to reduce the impact of the river's devastating floods. At 3,915 miles, that's 6,300 kilometers long, the Yangtze is the third longest river in the world, and does an estimated 400 million people living beside it or close by to it. That's over 70 million more people than live in the entire United States, by the way. China, really big country. When the Yangtze floods, it can cause devastation. Sadly, this has always been an annual occurrence, but the impact varies greatly from year to year. The worst flood the Yangtze had ever seen came in 1935, which resulted in the deaths of 145,000 people, and it remains the fifth worst flood in history. But to give you a good idea of just how bad the situation can be in China, the top five worst floods ever have all occurred in this country. The worst was one in 1931, which killed between one and four million people. In 1932, preliminary work began on the dam by the nationalist government, but it came to a grinding halt in 1939 with the Japanese invasion of China. As invasion turned to occupation, the Japanese took up the project themselves, eager for a showcase venture that would celebrate their imminent victory over the Chinese. But as things began to unravel for the Imperial Japanese forces in China and around Asia, the project was once again abandoned. Despite the ongoing fighting, and perhaps with one eye on the future, the Chinese the Chinese government recruited an American by the name of John L. Savage, head design engineer of the United States Bureau of Reclamation, to survey the area and put forth a proposal. His work was greeted with enthusiasm, and 54 Chinese engineers were packed off to the United States for training, while surveys and economic studies began to inspect the feasibility of the project. But once again, things were delayed by war. 
This time it was the Chinese Civil War, which had seen intermittent fighting since 1927, but it really reared its head in 1947, effectively halting any work on the dam project. What emerged in 1949, as you might well know, was China, but a little bit different. The victorious communist rebels, led by Mao Zedong, quickly took control of the country. Mao himself was a supporter of the project, but opted first to draw up plans for the Gezhoba Dam in Yichang, a project which was eventually shelved as the disastrous effects of the Great Leap Forward took effect. Then there was a catastrophic flood of the Yangtze in 1954, which reignited plans after Mao penned his famous poem, Swimming, in which he speaks lovingly of his desire for a dam. <laughs> All right, Mal. What's your beautiful poetry going to be about, Mal? It's going to be about dams. <laughs> in 1958, Chinese authorities announced the 100 Flowers campaign, in which people were encouraged to voice their opinions and thoughts about the communist regime. <laughs> How's that going to end? Spoiler alert, not well. Numerous engineers spoke out against the tentative plans for the dam on the Yangtze and quickly found themselves in jail as a consequence. Hey guys, what's your opinion? Oh, it's an opinion that we disagree with? Time for prison! <laughs> classic communist China. The entire campaign came to an end with a brutal crackdown on dissent. The tiny window of free speech had slammed shut and names had been taken. It wasn't until after the death of Mao Zedong in 1976 that plans for the dam began to re-emerge, but it remained highly controversial in terms of its social impact. Impact that we're going to be getting to shortly. In 1992, a vote was put forward at the Chinese Congress. Now, bear in mind that the Congress is very different from the Congress that might exist in your country. China has effectively been run by a Politburo, a group of senior leaders, or an outright leader for as long as could be remembered. While votes are indeed cast in Congress, the process is very much seen as symbolic. In its entire history, the Chinese Congress has never voted down a proposal put forward by the Politburo. But this time was as close as they'd ever come to it. Of the 3,000 delegates in Congress that day, only 67.75% voted yes. Which sounds like an overwhelming majority in any other country, but in China it's like, whoa, steady on. So what exactly were the doubts? Well, they weren't so much about the dam itself, but rather the consequences to the area. The design called for the flooding of three gorges, Kutang, Wuxia, and Xiling, areas known throughout China for their outstanding beauty. This has always been an area rich in biodiversity, home to some 6,388 different plant species, of which 57% are considered endangered. The proposed 410-mile-long reservoir would flood 244 square miles of land displacing vast amounts of people and submerging countless cities, towns, and villages. Compensation packages had been put in place for those displaced, including money and new homes away from the flooded area, but many remained fearful. Archaeological sites would also disappear beneath the water, including important sites of the Bar people who lived in the area over 4,000 years ago. On the other hand, proponents of the project argued that the dam would significantly reduce China's reliance on coal power stations while also opening up the Yangtze to trade like never before. With a higher water level, they estimated that barge capacity could be raised five or sixfold. Then there were the claims that the dam would be able to regulate water levels, meaning terrible flooding would now just be a thing of the past. The first phase of construction began in 1993 with the excavation of a side channel where water could be diverted to from the river during the main construction process. Construction finally began on the dam itself on December 14, 1994, and I'm sure that you won't be surprised to hear that it was the largest construction project in China at that time. One of the biggest obstacles to engineers was the need to keep the river open during construction for both water flow and river traffic. To do this, they began construction of large concrete structures known as coffer dams, which essentially blocked off sections of water to allow construction. These were built on several tons of earth that were placed onto the dry riverbed. Once these were finished, they would act as a shield in front of the actual dam that was being built behind them. The river was officially dammed in November 1997, causing water levels to rise as much as 10 meters and ending the first phase of construction. The second phase began shortly after with the addition of the concrete. Now, this sounds like a quick process, but what began from the left-hand bank working slowly right took a total of over four years. Just 
I mean, remember how much concrete goes into this thing. Once the concrete was in place, the first turbines and generators were slowly added. The cofferdams were then destroyed with explosives, allowing the water to finally reach their intended destination the turbines. Unsurprisingly, the decision was taken to bring the generators online in stages. That way, the dam could begin generating electricity without being complete. Generator number two on the north side holds the distinction of becoming the first active generator on July the 10th, 2003. The entire north side became operational on September the 7th, 2005, but ran at reduced power until the 18th of October, 2006, when, after the water level in the reservoir reached 156 meters, it finally reached 9,800 megawatts. Watts. On the south side, generator number 22 became operational on the 11th of June 2007 with successive generations starting up over the following years. The 18th of December 2007 was an important date for the Three Gorges Dam as it finally reached 14.1 gigawatts, surpassing the Itaipu Dam on the Brazilian-Paraguay border and becoming the largest hydro dam in the world in terms of output. And that dam on, in Brazil and Paraguay is an incredible feat as well. I really feel if we covered it here on Mega Projects, it would just be too similar to this story but if you guys are crazy to know about that dam let me know in the comments below and i'll uh have a look at it see if it's worth doing the final main generator number 27 became operational on the 23rd of may 2012. In total, there are 33 enormous turbines, each capable of producing 700 megawatts of electricity, along with 34 generators weighing 6,000 tons each. Now, I promised to use some stats on how much energy this generates compared to, you know, other power stations. So consider this. When the dam is running at full capacity, it's producing just over four times the energy of the most powerful nuclear power station in the world and could provide the daily electricity requirement for about 20 million people in the UK. So this thing could essentially power a quarter of the United Kingdom. Water is directed into the dam and down concrete tubes to the turbines. This enables them to spin and activates the generators and thus producing electricity. Of these generators, 14 were installed on the north side of the dam, 12 on the south side, and the remaining six are in the mountains south of the dam. Now, perhaps the biggest worry about the dam isn't what you can see, but rather what you can't. The foundations of the Three Gorges Dam are by far the most vital aspect. Any failure here could lead to an unimaginable disaster. Indeed, I think there was a dam collapse. The biggest dam collapse ever was in 19th century in China. I'm, I, I gotta look this up. Yeah, the Bangkwao Dam in, oh, 1975. Wow, it's much more recent than I thought. Yeah, the, the dam collapsed in 1975, the Bangkwao Dam, also in China. Just to give you an idea of the scale of these disasters, of what they can cause. This disaster killed, it was an insane, it was just an unbelievable number of people. Estimated death toll ranges up to 240,000 people, which is extraordinary. So yeah, dam failures, not good things. To try and alleviate some of the pressure on the foundations, as well as helping to regulate water levels, a 483-meter spillway was installed in the center of the dam. This can be opened and closed, allowing more or less water to travel through. This includes 22 sluice gates, each 8 meters wide, which fire water through at an absolutely astonishing rate. The dam receives over 150 freight ships per day, making it one of the biggest locks in the world. Ships are enclosed within the locks and then move up or down depending on which way they are traveling, a process that takes a total of five hours. However, for passenger ships, this time is greatly reduced by using a different method with a ship lift transporting boats up or down in just 40 minutes. This is done by using a helical gear system by which counterweights within the concrete walls are used to elevate the ships. As we talked about earlier, this has been a project with a lot of conspiracy from the very start, and, well, this has continued since then. Shortly after the filling of the reservoir, 80 hairline cracks appeared on the dam structure, despite all 163,000 concrete units passing quality control tests. The Chinese government was, of course, quick to dismiss these cracks, but doubts certainly remain. Another attack leveled at the dam is that it's not actually doing what was promised. Remember at the start I mentioned those catastrophic floods? Well, though nothing that bad that has happened, many have pointed out that the last decade has seen enormous flooding in the area. It's likely there are other causes of this, such as climate change, but considering the project was heavily sold on this aspect, many are understandably questioning the dam's role. 
What's more, the percentage of China's total electricity gained from the dam is also considerably less than was thought. In 1993, it was believed that the dam would eventually be able to generate about 10% of China's electrical needs, but with soaring use and an ever-growing population, that figure is now just 1.25% of China's power supply. There has also been an increase in mudslides in the area. In the first four months of 2010 alone, there were no fewer than 97 serious incidents caused by erosion in the reservoir. Now, the Three Gorges Dam was always going to be a balance between the positive and the negative. Apart from human displacement, the most significant impact has been on the environment. From the very beginning, environmentalists warned that the dam would have a serious impact on nutrients downstream as well as sediment flow. This is likely to have enormous ramifications on the ecosystem in the Yangtze, neighboring rivers, as well as seacoast areas. A report in 2006 found that ratios of silicon to nitrogen in brackish coastal waters fell from 1.5 in 1998 to 0 0.4 in 2004, a change that could cause significant damage to marine life in coastal areas, leading to the further depletion of fish numbers. Further, sediment loading, which measures solid matter carried by a river, was found in places to be half of the pre-dam levels, which likely led to increased erosion in tidal wetlands, risking further landslides. Lastly, rumblings of corruption have gone on as long as the project has. The Chinese government is, of course, tight-lipped about this sort of thing. Rumors have long circulated, though. Allegedly, funds for 13,000 farmers in the Gaoyang area disappeared after being sent to the local government. One problem that you might not have considered about this dam is the incredible amount of rubbish that drifts down it. In 2006, it was estimated that the dam had already blocked 10 million tons of rubbish that would have otherwise flowed out to sea. Now, you don't need me to tell you that all of that is going to build up and get into the turbines. Once this happens, at best, some of the turbines stop working, and at worst, it could cause a pressure buildup within the dam that, if left, could eventually cause huge structural damage. But they've come up with a rather ingenious solution for this. They call it the lapping tunnel. Hung. A rolling track, a little bit like a mechanical walkway that you find in the airport attached to a garbage boat, it quite literally laps up rubbish. The device can consume 300 cubic meters, that's 360 cubic feet of rubbish per hour. Where it all goes after that, well, we don't really know. It's China, tight lipped government. But certainly, it goes somewhere far away. Further, over 5 million tons of silt and sediment become trapped at the bottom of the reservoir each year. Such a buildup can eventually have an impact on wildlife and even mechanical systems such as piping. With such a huge buildup, the dam needs its own system to push silt and sediment through to the other side. The sluice gates that regulate water levels are also used for this and are periodically opened with the help of hydraulic pistons to push the silt and sediment through the dam and into the river beyond. The final numbers associated with this dam can make slightly uncomfortable reading. In total, 1.2 million people were displaced by the construction, while 140 towns, 13 cities, and 1,600 settlements disappeared underwater. Though there are no definite numbers, the Chinese government has acknowledged more than 100 deaths during the construction of the dam. The final cost is thought to be in the region of $37 billion, though questions have been raised as to whether that could, in fact, be even higher. However, that number doesn't quite seem so high by the fact that by 2013, the dam had effectively paid for itself through energy output. There are really few projects that can compare to the financial cost of the Three Gorges Dam, and perhaps none that has had the same humanitarian impact. Most likely, we won't know for many years whether it was all worth it. Will it be remembered as a magnificent human achievement that brought clean energy to China? Or will it be remembered as a bloated ecological disaster that caused great hardship to millions? Well, we're just going to have to wait and see. And so I really hope you enjoyed this episode of Mega Projects. If you did, please do smash that thumbs up button below. Don't forget to subscribe. Brand new videos a couple of times a week is the schedule we're on right now. Suggestions as well, please leave them below. And thank you for watching.